right? And so suffering really becomes a reality as a result of the introduction of sin and death into the human experience. Christ comes and he redeems us. Right. I thought we were restored whole again. Why still the pain? Why the suffering? When he says, take up your cross and follow me, we'll follow you where? Hmm. You know, I, I often ask, like, where am I following you to? But ultimately, I'm following him into glory. The Holy Spirit is is um, the seal, the you know the stamp, and the image in that seal is Christ. The image that's in that seal is the image of Christ, and He makes holy ones with the image of the Holy One when He stamps on us. Right. The most important thing that should inspire us from the life of Saint Pope Gregorius or any saint is to love God generously. Welcome back to the COA podcast. Today we're very blessed, very lucky. Uh, try not to be confused because we have two Father Kiroloses. We're going to go with that. Is that plural of Kirolos? Yeah, sure. Cyril and Coptic, am I right? No, not Cyril and Coptic? In English? Yeah, that's what I mean. Cyril and English, right? Yes? We'll go with that. We'll go with that? All right. Because <laughs> that was the same thing, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to a great start right now. This is excellent. So we have, we're very blessed. We have Father Kirillos uh, Morad with us from Virgin Mary Coptic Orthodox Church here in Montreal. And we have Father Kirillos Ibrahim coming to us from St. Paul's Coptic uh, Orthodox Church in Irvine, California. Father? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you both for coming. We're very blessed. Today is a tough topic. It's one that we will try to find you know, some lightheartedness in and some humor at times, but it's a tough one. And if you're listening, it's probably for a reason. And so today's podcast is about suffering, but we're not going to address suffering in the existential way of, you know, why God does this happen? Hopefully, God willing, one day we'll, we'll get to some of those answers. But today we really wanted to benefit from both priests with us here to answer the question of how do I use suffering? How does God want me to use the suffering? how to become a saint from suffering and maybe take some examples of very uh, beautiful saints in our church. So um, I'm going to start it very general and very introductory, Father. Was there suffering since the very beginning, our creation? Well, first of all, it's a great blessing to be with, with all of you. And, and this is certainly not an easy topic, uh, but certainly an essential topic for us to explore together as Christians. And uh, obviously, when we look at any question like the question of suffering, we have to look at it through the lens of a certain worldview. And our Christian worldview has a very specific theology about sort of the condition of man before the fall and after the fall. And uh, before the fall, there was no suffering in paradise, right? We, we could speak about what some of the fathers call like the original harmony that existed in paradise. There was a harmony between uh, man and God. There was a harmony uh, between man and, and, and fellow man, in this case, Adam and Eve, right? Like a social harmony. There was a harmony within man himself. That is, his appetites were sort of governed by proper reason. Um, and there was a harmony between man and the, the rest of creation, the, the animal world. And when sin was introduced into the reality of the human experience, right, then we, we know that as a result of sin, death and corruption entered into the world. And from that, also, there was sort of a disharmony that was created between God and man, between man and man, and between man and himself, and between man and the, the animal world. Right? And so suffering really becomes a reality as a result of the introduction of sin and death into the human experience. So forgive me, let me dumb it down. I'm, I'm with sure. two masters in theology <laughs> here, so clearly I have to dumb it down for myself. Adam's walking in the Garden of Eden, and yes. he stumps his toe on one of the trees. Was pain a thing at that point in time, in the very beginning? Was there even pain? Do we? I know, maybe I don't know, but is, is that something that only came after the fall? As far as as far as my understanding of like what was revealed in Scripture, right? Uh, there 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 is no sort of 
story of let's say Adam stumping his like toe mm-hmm. in a tree, right? <laughs> uh, but the the experience of pain and suffering, of uh, distress, of uh, anguish, all of these are are foreign to the experience of pre-fallen man, right? Man is in total bliss, mm. total uh, harmony and peace. Um, so so pain wasn't. Right. I mean, even, you know, the, the pain of childbearing is something that's a result of the fall. Right. So I think my understanding, I, I don't know if Father Corliss uh, has something to add to that, is that there's no there's no understanding of pain before the fall. Hmm. Yeah, the sadness, sorrow and sighing, as we say, in right. the language of the departed. Because yeah. that's that's if we look also to what's the promise, right, mm-hmm. of, of paradise, right, what we recover uh in the kingdom of god right there is no pain there is no there is no weeping sorrow sighing so the understanding is that before the fall mm-hmm. none of those things would have been present as well so you you said before the fall so christ comes and he redeems us right i thought we were restored whole again why still the pain why the suffering what's yeah. the the point of that after being restored, redeemed. Yeah. I mean, you could say the same thing about uh, death, right? If Christ overcame death, well, we still f- experience physical death, mm-hmm. right? So there, there's still a sort of remnant of of our sort of the the Adamic sin. You know, there's still mm-hmm. the the consequences of certain aspects of the fall that continue, right? And there's a reason for that. I think, for example, when we we look at sin itself. Uh, St. John, in his epistle, I think in the fourth chapter, he speaks about, you know, the one who was born of God, who has the seed of God in him, cannot sin, right? But the third chapter, the chapter just before that, he says that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who has become the propitiation. It's that word that most readers Mm -hmm. can't say, right? Was it not propitiation this whole time? (laughs) Oops. (laughs) The sacrifice, right? So which one is it? Can we not sin or we? So Mm -hmm. what he's talking about is that we have as a result of our participation in Christ's redemption, right? Through baptism, dying and rising with him in baptism. We have the new man, right? But this new man will be realized in, in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, we will not be able to sin. We will not be tempted. We will not be able to sin. We have that experience of the new man within us, but we also have sort of the leftover the, or the remnant of the original sin, the ancestral sin, right? And the reason why both have to remain is because our freedom has to still participate in choosing, saying yes to God, right? If God were sort of by baptism or to remove the possibility of sin, right, then, then we wouldn't be free. So this is still the time of choosing, right? It's still the time of saying yes to God and choosing to to follow his commandments, be his disciples, you know, struggle uh, against the flesh and the desires of the flesh. So the same thing, I think, with suffering, right? That suffering, Christ didn't come to remove suffering, but he came to enter into suffering Mm -hmm. and to transform suffering and to make a way through suffering that could be redemptive, salvific and 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 ultimately part of the witness of uh, the evangelical witness of our christian faith when you see somebody who suffers and loves god in that suffering and is grateful to god in that suffering that's a more powerful witness than just preaching the the word Mm -hmm. you know so so suffering and we can speak about like the 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 reasons why suffering has a sort of important part in the christian experience mm-hmm. uh, if, if we want to go there now or no I, I i just wanted to interrupt you because you said christ entered into the suffering there's something that i i heard you father actually in, in one of your sermons you're talking about christ kind of like the inverted pyramid and i found that fascinating yeah. so if you can just you know recap it i have a few questions sure. about, about him you know kind of going to the bottom so of that pyramid. the model of the inverted pyramid is not my model it's a model that um was given by a contemporary Eastern Orthodox uh, elder who was recently canonized, Elder Sophroni of Essex, England, and uh, related through the teachings and the writings of his disciple, who is currently uh, a spiritual father and writer on the ascetical life, 
uh, and also in Essex, England, at the monastery there, uh, whose name is Father Zechariah Zacharu. And the explanation that Father Zacharias gives of his elders' teaching is that he says the world is like a pyramid where the powerful, the rich, the uh, those who exploit the others sit at the top of the pyramid and they sit on top of the shoulders of the weaker, you know, members of, of the world, of the society. And so inherent in that structure, of course, is total injustice. And he says that Christ came and he took that pyramid and he inverted it and he became the head of the inverted pyramid. So he put himself at the bottom of the inverted pyramid and that means that he went downward, right, to the, to the depths, to the pits of mm. not only in his condescen condescension in his uh, incarnation, but even entering into the, to the depths of Hades, right? And he carries through his salvific works, his love, his redemption, he carries the weight of the whole world on, as the head of the inverted pyramid. And, and the beauty of that model is that Christ invites all of us to make that downward journey to be with him at the head of the inverted pyramid, right? And so what that means is that there is only one way for the Christian life, right? Which is that downward, that kenosis, that self-emptying. Uh, and that Christ wants us to participate in the proclamation and the effect of his redemption. What do I mean by that? When we pray for each other, we believe that our prayers have uh, value before God, right? So in a sense, too, our participation in the sufferings of Christ also proclaim his death and his resurrection and bring about the effects of, of his redemption. And, and this is what St. Paul talked about in his epistle to the Colossians when he said, I make up in my own body right, what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Sort of an outrageous comment that he makes. What can be possibly lacking in the afflictions of Christ? But he says he does that as a member of the church, on behalf of the church. right? So that Christ as the head, he entered into suffering. He entered into the experience of suffering. He became the head of the inverted pyramid. And all of us that choose to be his disciples, to follow in his path by carrying our cross and following him, we also participate in some way in that process of bearing the burdens of the world. And that means we suffer. If and I may, Father, though, that... There's two kind of sufferings in there, two kinds of sufferings, forgive me, in there where one is chosen suffering, you know, I, I choose right. to go with Christ, and then the one that's kind of forced upon sure. me. So let's stick with the first one, because it kind of seems that that's kind of what you're implying, that I, I take up my cross and not the so one. So let's use the words voluntary and involuntary. Fantastic. So the voluntary suffering, yeah. see, I told you, masters and not so much. So... Uh, the voluntary, don't laugh at me, uh, the, the voluntary... No, this I will. better than force, that's it. <laughs> the, the voluntary suffering. You're in North America here. That's a, that's a dangerous word to almost say, you know, like the voluntary. It's almost like, are you socialist? Are you communist? Are you, you know, giving... Like, it's what I earned and, and who I am. And because you're saying, like, it's, the, you know, the rich are on top of the poor and... But that's not what you're you're meaning. You're not meaning that, you know, I have to feel a guilt over no. being successful or a guilt. You're saying that I'm voluntary kind of. Well, first bearing. of all, let's let's uh, so so we're we don't sort of like go too far off. Like, what do we mean by voluntary suffering? We certainly don't mean that as Christians, we although some saints may have in their own unique calling or circumstance uh, chosen uh, or sought suffering, but for the majority of us Christians, we are not to seek suffering. Mm -hmm. We're not to ask for suffering because that could be presumptuous. We could be sort of like the, in the ear of the martyrs, there were some who out of presumption, not out of, out of, out of a real sense of vocation or calling from oh, God, yeah. they went to the governors and, and then they, they renounced Christ. They couldn't carry through with the, with the mm -hmm. sacrifice. Right. So so we have to be careful that we're not when we say voluntary for us, voluntary suffering is basically 
you know, uh, the way of the cross. It's it's carrying the cross, the daily dying, dying to ourselves, the the what we call sometimes call the ascetical life. So you're right? not referring to charity. You're not referring to hard work for someone else. Well, not... certainly, certainly it includes. Um, <clears throat> so it includes the ascetical practices, like obviously, like uh, denying ourselves, self control, right, fasting, you know, uh, prostrations and prayers, vigils, these things where we discipline the body. But it also includes sort of the uh, the, the decisions to to have long suffering love with those who oppose us, to uh, accept persecution, to love our enemies, uh, to be patient and tolerant mm -hmm. with those who annoy us and disturb us. Right? That's a real martyrdom, a daily martyrdom. That's a real suffering. When I'm at work and I'm being persecuted, or I'm at church and I'm being persecuted, or you know, and and I suffer silently for the sake of Christ, the meek lamb who who opened not his mouth, right? That's Rejoice suffering. in being seemingly glad. Yeah, for great for great reward. Yeah. So that that is a but that's a volunt that's a voluntary suffering of carrying the cross with Christ. He asked. That's that's the gospel. That's the commandments. Right. That's different than the involuntary suffering that you call like suffering that's forced upon us, yeah. you know, or that's, we didn't choose. Right. And so, but, but when it comes to like all of those things, we don't run after those things. We don't choose those things. We, what's more important, I think, to think of this in terms of the spiritual life is doing the will of God, right? What's most important is the will of God. It's mm. not my will. If, if my will is to suffer and it's not God's will for me, then that's, again, that's, that's that's not uh, you know spiritually healthy. That's presumption, right? So it's more of aligning my will with the will of God, right? There is one one of the saints who said, "I would rather be a vile worm by the will of God than one of the seraphim by my own will," right? So it's about what is God's will, and if His will is for me to endure some hardships, some suffering, some distress then I do it because I want to align my will with his will. I love his will. But if I, again, if I choose it on my own will and it's not what's good for me or the right time or I'm not mature spiritually enough to handle that kind of suffering, then ultimately it's going to it's going to hurt me. It's going to harm me. So then let's, while we're still on the voluntary side, Forget to uh, masters in theology, uh, priests, and uh, come You're to... You're going to keep mentioning yeah, this yeah. every <laughs> yeah. And focus on layman Paul right over here. Where do I start to descend that pyramid? Yes. What? what like, give me my... You know, I go to work, I come back home, I, I'm late, I you know, go with the kids to their soccer practices, basketball. Like, where am I? How do I do that? Where do I find my place in that pyramid? I think very simply, it's it's following the gospel, like 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 uh, living the gospel, right? If you if you live the gospel, if you read the Sermon on the Mount and you do the things that our Lord commands us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, again, you begin to live that voluntary life of self denial, of sacrifice, of carrying the cross, of suffering, right? Of suffering in the way again, in, in the small ways that come to us every day. Right, so following the commandments, obeying the commandments, struggling to keep the commandments, um, obeying the church. You know, sometimes people ask, uh, or they'll say, you know, I fasted, but I didn't really feel a benefit, so I, maybe I shouldn't fast. And 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 the question I often ask is, what kind of benefit did you expect? Hmm. Were you expecting that after you fasted and you did everything, you ticked off? off Walk on water. Off? Uh, yeah, that you're going to start like <laughs> levitating when you uh, pray. Healing or... people with my sight, you know. Like I just... said, but but maybe all you gained from fasting was <laughs> obeying the church mm -hmm. and denying yourself. But there's nothing more. I, I'm, I'm just I'm just I'm just yeah. saying that that in and of itself, yeah. the, the the practice of denying yourself mm -hmm. out of obedience is beneficial, right? So. My point is, is that by obeying the gospel, the evangelical mm -hmm. counsels of the gospel, by struggling to keep the commandments, by following the path that the church gives us, that is enough to put us on the path of, of what's the voluntary part fr from us, right? And that'll prepare us, because I think this is what you were getting at, is, is that will prepare me then for the involuntary suffering, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, we, we had planned to talk a little bit about a mm -hmm. contemporary person that I knew, Tan Samira, mm -hmm. you know, and she suffered a lot in her life um, in, in different ways. 
from within her family, uh, financially, from uh, many, many illnesses, right? And what prepared her to endure that suffering and to rejoice in it, right? Like St. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings, right? Um, was that she had already lived a life from, from a very young age. She was living a life of involuntary, right? of involuntary, you know, uh, or sorry, voluntary uh, mm -hmm. sacrifice, voluntary suffering through the way of the gospel and the church, you know, not in some extraordinary way, but that prepared her for the more extraordinary sacrifices that God asked of her, you know, so, so that when that difficulty comes, whether it's an illness or a real hardship within our families, if we've already been living as disciples of Christ, carrying our cross, we will be better prepared to see the will of God and, and the um, sort of what's waiting on the other side of that, right? There was, a, sorry, I'll just very briefly, there was a, a beautiful, I just remembered this, uh, uh, one of the monastic saints, a nun, she had a vision and uh, she saw three groups of people. There were one group, they were crucified on, on crosses next to Christ. And there was another group, they were holding their cross uh, firmly in their hands. And then there was a third group that were dragging their crosses sort of behind them reluctantly. And then the voice of Christ came to her and said, those who resemble me most in my sufferings and in, 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 in my cross will, will resemble me most in my glory. Mm. Right. And so we could see sort of like this uh, progression, right? There are those who sort of reluctantly drag their crosses. There are those who carry their crosses, but don't embrace their crosses. And there are those who fully embrace their cross. Right now, we have to start at some point in our life. Mm -hmm. And the church and the gospels give us the, the tools, I think, Father, right? I agree. <laughs> Can uh, so then can I just replace voluntary suffering from a Christian perspective as anything that causes self denial? Like, is that the purpose? Is that I just have to choose the path of denying myself? Is that it? I mean, I think self denial is a big part of of sort of an underlying uh, component to obedience to uh, adhering to the gospel commandments. Uh, but it's, mo it's ultimately, I think, about discipleship and the will of God, right? And mm -hmm. to be a disciple of Christ, he says, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, it's interesting because when he says, take up your cross and follow me, we'll, f we'll follow you where? Mm -hmm. I, I often ask, like, where am I following you to? Well, ultimately... I'm following him into glory, right? It's not just an earthly discipleship, you know? So one of the saints said, he said, we are destined for Mount Tabor, but we are formed on Mount Calvary. Mm. That's, you don't need a master's for that, right? Mm. Just think about it. Like uh, the, our destiny is to be glorified with him like he was glorified on Mount Tabor when Moses and Elijah appeared with him in that mm. beautiful light, right? Mm. That's where he's calling us to, but we are formed on Mount Calvary carrying the cross which is what so, he discusses with Moses and Elijah right that's right. the beautiful thing forward. about that event is right as father said is that what are they talking about as they appear in that glory they're talking about the cross things he was yeah yeah so Sit now down. if I shift to involuntary suffering yes. is that how so its place in the pyramid is it yes. just accepting it willingly being thankful through it what that's I didn't good. choose it sure it was, sure so let's 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 think about uh, maybe in a more systematic way. Uh, what good does suffering bring to the Christian experience? Mm. I would say first of all is that suffering has a way of awakening us to spiritual realities. Right? That 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 many people, and I'm sure Father has seen this in his ministry. Suffering has a way of awakening them to the reality of mortality to the reality of needing to repent, right? Like the prodigal son, right? He is suffering in his condition, and this awakens him to the reality of his father's home, right? So 
suffering has a, 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 a tremendous impact in shaking us up, you know, from yeah. our sleepwalking of, white, of life to, to think more about eternal life, about God, about, you know, uh, am I ready? You know. um, secondly, I think suffering oftentimes can be a test. Like in the case of Job, uh, there are moments where sort of God allows this suffering to come upon us in order to, again, sort of help reveal to us, uh, you know, which path am I going to choose, right? Because suffering could be, for some people, could lead them to bitterness and resentment. And for others, it can lead them to a more uh, perfect and beautiful commitment to to follow Christ and to ultimately uh, an experience, a transformative experience of mm -hmm. suffering that is uh, full of joy and, 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 and glory, right? So, so it can become a sort of, a, it creates a sort of fork in the road for us. Um, and sort of tests our love, right? Oftentimes we think we're disciples. We think we're faithful servants of the church. We think we love God. Uh, a small, sometimes just a very small suffering comes upon us. And we realize that, that you know, that sort of the security that we built our life upon is, is shaken. And we realize our love was not so strong. Our faith was not so strong. You know, our our devotion to discipleship was not so strong and so, so we need that sometimes because sometimes we live with a, a false notion of how spiritually mature we are and suffering has a way of sort of again exposing yeah and then oh, let's, like, let's just finish these last two mm -hmm. points before i forget and then mm -hmm. you can follow up um i think the third one um is that it it gives us a chance to prove our love right because again um Two ways that one shows their love for another person. To, to do the good for the other, to will and to do the good for the other, and to suffer for the other. Right. So we could think about how God, up until the incarnation, he could show his love by willing and doing the good for his creation. Right. But in order to complete the picture of divine love, he he has to suffer for us. And how can he do that unless he enters into the human condition, takes flesh, and then and then suffers for us, right? So in a sense, then, he shows us that, that the, the, the pinnacle of love is not just that I will, the, which is, you know, a lot of people can do that. You don't have to be Christian to desire the good for another, to will the good for another. But to really be willing to suffer for others, especially for your enemy, right? That's the pinnacle uh, of love, right? So, so suffering gives us an opportunity to love heroically you know to to love and to for the divine virtue of love to to be raised to heroic levels right and then the other thing which i think is also very important and maybe it's not so pleasant but is that suffering purifies right i mean this is all throughout the scriptures you know that gold is purified in the fire Right. And 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 so, you know, wisdom of Sirach, chapter two. Right. I mean, it's, it's we, we read it during Holy Week. It's a beautiful chapter. Um, that, the son, if thou comest to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. Right. So um, we need to be sort of purified. Right. We need to we need to have all of that uh, that rust and that filthiness that, you know, uh, we carry uh, be, be purified so that we're left with the pure gold of our soul, you know, and, and so suffering has a way, whether it's pleasant or not, right? I mean, certainly it's not pleasant, but it has a way of purifying. It removes all of that rust. So someone is going to be watching and wanting to ask the question, how do I know which kind I'm suffering? You know, I, I myself, I'm in a, in a trial or whatever it be. Yeah. Is it God wanting to wake me up? Is, is it God not punishing me, but trying to, Probably all of them. Does, yeah, <laughs> purify, yeah, like, does it even matter is the question. I think I think in the moment it doesn't matter. I think in the moment what we need is a sort of, like you mentioned the word like resignation, abandonment. Like we need first to come to a point of, of trusting in the goodness of God and the love of God behind all of what happens in our life. And, and knowing that the purpose of that suffering will be revealed in time, you know, uh, very, can I share a, a quick story? Yeah, please. I just, before you mm -hmm. share it, and I just, 
talking with people who are going through trials or, or whatever be like real things like yeah. I, I don't want to presume to have gone through some of the things that people go through the resounding feeling is i need to know why because i need to know how to alleviate it i don't know that the why alleviates the the, the pain um because you're still gonna you know because uh, if it's i'm doing something wrong you know you see the yeah. thought process if, if it's because i've done something wrong in my life tell me what it is even, so i can alleviate book of Job, even even if yeah, Job, well, that was the whole thing, right? Even He's if trying... our suffering is self-induced, mm-hmm. like even if suffering is a consequence of something we have done, our love for Christ has a way of um, ensuring that even that suffering, he will turn to good, mm-hmm. right? That's what St. Paul says. Uh, all things happen for the good for those who love God, right? So, so even our mistakes and our you know, a uh, contribution to our own suffering. If we love Christ, if we entrust ourselves to, to him and, and desire his will, he will turn that suffering into good. So nothing is outside of his good, loving providence to bring about a good result from anything that we, that we, that we go through. Um, the story I was going to mention is about somebody who was actually a relative of mine who died of cancer at a fairly young age. Um, and I had just been ordained a priest uh, and had seen him for the first time uh, after he had been sort of in and out of the hospital for a couple of years, I think, with surgeries and chemo, and he was really in bad shape. And we were having like a big family reunion, and so I finally saw him at this family reunion, and he pulls me aside, and he says, Father, I want to tell you something. He said, if I could go back and have the, uh, the possibility of not having the cancer, I would not choose it. He said, I can't tell you how many blessings I have had through this experience. And I, he's saying, I said, he said, I'm telling you, and he had young children. Like, you, you know, mm, he, you say, I, if I had tough, the possibility yeah. to go back and not have the cancer, I wouldn't choose it. And I, and I, and I remember at the time feeling sort of like, like angry, like, you know, like you can't possibly mean that, mm-hmm. you know, who, who wouldn't choose to go back and not have cancer? and live longer and see his kids get married and all, you know. And and then I came to the conclusion, I said, you know what? This is a mystery. This is an intimate experience, right? And this is, St. Isaac the Syrian has this beautiful quote. He says, the knowledge of the cross is hidden or concealed in the experience of, of the cross, right? In other words, a lot of what we're saying is theory and and you know uh, intellectual like understandings from the, the writings of the saints and so on. Observations, but observations, right? Which which is good, which is necessary. Sure. But Isaac the Syrian is saying the real understanding of the cross is contained in the experience of the cross, right? And so when somebody like this this relative of mine, when he's going through that, and he has a, a, a sort of intimacy with Christ that he'd never had before. And this becomes a sort of interior uh, confirmation of, 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 of the transform, transformative power of suffering, right? All we could do is like sort of remain silent. We can't totally understand it, Let right? All Let all, yeah, you can't totally understand it. But this is, this, is, this is the Christian life, right? We're in a relationship. We're not, right? Uh, so... Some of the, some of this, you know, when you're asking about people who go through these things, is that, of course, we could advise, we could encourage, we can console as best as we can, but ultimately, it's Christ Himself who gives the consolation, you know, and and who guides the person to understand what the meaning of suffering is for them. Sometimes the fruit of that suffering may not be revealed for till much later in their life. They look back and they 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 say, Ah, now I know why I went through that. Perhaps some of our suffering will, will only be known in the next world, you know. Uh, that, or sorry, I, I know I'm, no, uh, I just remembered another story and I didn't want to lose it. Um, the contemporary uh, Greek uh, saint, Elder Paisius, mm. he had uh, a very beautiful experience with the fourth century martyr Euphemia. Uh, he was praying in his cell on Mount Athos and he was specifically asking for her uh, intercession for I think three specific things he was praying about. And I'm not, women are not allowed on the mountain, right? So in the middle of the night, he this knock on his door 
He opens the door. He sees the saint. So first thing he does is he asks the saint to make the sign of the cross and to say a prayer to make sure it's not the devil. She does. And then he tells her to bow. He had like a small chapel in his uh, cell. He asks her to also to make a prostration. And she does. So then he knows it's really the saint. And so she says, God sent me to give you the response to the three things that you were praying for. And she gave it to him. And then he said, I want to ask you, um, how is it you were able to endure all of your, uh, your persecutions and your, your sufferings? Because she, she suffered as a martyr. And she said, and I'm sort of paraphrasing now, but she said to him, she said, Father, if, if I knew then what I experience now in the glory of paradise, I would have asked to be left for a thousand years to suffer more. Right? So, you know, God will never be outdone in generosity. Mm -hmm. The suffering that anyone endures for his sake in this life will be given, I can't say a thousandfold, I mean, infinite, mm -hmm. you know, amount. Perhaps some of it here, but certainly in the kingdom of God. But I am sure some of it here too, because, you know, St. Paul says that as our sufferings abound in Christ, so also do our consolations abound in Christ, right? So there's a promise there, right? Mm -hmm. If we do not, again, and this is the, the difficulty, right, is if we do not totally resist the suffering, we can still struggle with it, of course, we, 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 we must. But if we don't reject it and resist it, and become bitter and, and, and angry over the suffering. I'm certain the consolations of Christ will reveal to the person in a very intimate, unique way, the meaning of that suffering. And just, in the here and now. In the here and now. And to clarify, I mean, for that saint, it was her martyrdom, but someone going through a cancer or a disease of whatever it be, if they deal with it faithfully, is it some sort of equivalence there in the eyes of God? Of course. Of course. I mean, there are contemporary saints who have spoken of, uh, like uh, Saint Bishoy Kemet, mm -hmm. who has spoken of uh, cancer as the, the illness of paradise. And uh, there are others who had visions of people who said that in, there's a, a very high place in paradise for, for people who had cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, again, we have to trust, mm -hmm. right? Trust our Lord uh, with his divine will, his his beautiful perfect providential will for all of us um again that doesn't mean it's easy it doesn't mean we don't struggle it doesn't mean we don't ask questions but that's why we have the church to support us we have mm -hmm. spiritual fathers we have the saints we have the the prayers uh you know we have the community i mean that's a beautiful thing that we're not suffering alone for those who are suffering alone or suffering without christ and then they're asking well then what's my payoff? You know what I mean? They weren't prepared through the voluntary, you know, self-denials, voluntary suffering. Can they, in their trial at that moment, it's not too late, right? They can find God and use it at the same time. That could be their martyrdom, right? Like they can, there's still a purpose for the everyone. thief on the cross, the right hand thief. Uh, one word is all it took. So certainly, I, I think that many people who are non-believers, suffering can be. Again, you know, we said one of, the, one of the reasons for suffering is to awaken us. So if, if suffering can bring about uh, for somebody who doesn't believe to, to think more seriously about their mortality and about the possibility of eternal life and, and, and faith in God, and they turn to him in that very moment, they could be saved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are, there are saints who speak about this beautiful notion that sort of God is working on the human soul to the last breath. So that there are people that we think they died as unbelievers because, you know, we didn't see the last moments or the last seconds of their life. But it could literally be the last breath where they said, Lord, have mercy on me. Yeah. And that was enough. I think Elder Paisius, he tells a story of a family that came and was very distraught about, I think, their, their, their son or a child or, or somebody related to them who committed suicide by jumping off of a bridge. You know, and they were, of course, very distraught, like, you know, is this person saved? And Elder Paisius could say that as he threw himself 
And he said, Lord, forgive me. Have mercy mm -hmm. on me. And he said he was saved. Lord God. Right? So, it, you know, so, so it doesn't take much. At least, th again, this is this is what the experience of the saints t teach us. Mm -hmm. So then in, in this case, it's almost futile or foolish to ask the question, what alleviates it? Or if I get back to the right path, does that save me from suffering? Or that's not the point, right? The point is gaining from it. Yeah, I, again, I think the point is not to do something to alleviate. Uh, well, let me let's let me look, look, answer that in two ways. Number one, uh, you know, the more pious we are, the more religious we are, doesn't mean we're, you know, we're protecting ourselves from suffering. It could be the contrary, right? Like, uh, so, so it's, there's nothing we can do in the Christian life to avoid suffering, let's say. Um, and so, like we said earlier, uh, we don't seek suffering, right? But we also don't avoid it. But in saying we don't avoid it, that doesn't mean we don't um, do the humanly sort of necessary things to remove our self-will. What I mean by that is that if I get sick, I don't say, well, okay, if it's God's will, you know, he'll heal me. No, God's will is, is revealed through the human means that are available to us, right? So I go to the doctor, you know, I do a surgery, I take medicine, and what's left is God's will, right? Like, this is actually the, what's beautiful about Tamav Irini, another contemporary saint at our church, um, is that from her biography, we are told that she sort of sought um, the cross of illness. She, she, she desired to be a martyr like her beloved uh, Saint Mercurius of Usfin, and uh, it, that wasn't God's will for her. But So she asked for the cross of illness. Now, you might say, okay, well, then if she asked for it, then that's it. Whatever, whatever came to her, heart disease, whatever, you know, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, or whatever, then she would just, you know, be passive. But no, she went, she did surgeries. She flew across the ocean to America to do surgeries. She took medicine. She followed up with doctor's appointments. Why? Because she needed to remove any presumption on her part or any self-will on her part. Uh, so, yes, she did suffer much from physical ailments, but she, again, she had to do everything that was humanly possible in order to discern, again, what was truly God's will and not her own will. But you keep saying we don't seek it out, but she sought it out. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, there? so early, earlier I said, again, like some of the saints sometimes asked for things that are are... are not meant for everybody to sort of imitate, right? Uh, have you heard of, for example, the Fools for Christ? So the, the Fools for Christ is sort of category of saints in, in, in the Orthodox Church in which some saints sort of took upon themselves this sort of extreme form of asceticism and um, foolishness and hiddenness of their virtue um, sometimes acting in crazy manners, you know, to deflect from their sanctity and to, you know, sort of trick people as to wondering whether they were saints or fools, you know. Um, and again, sometimes a saint might have a unique calling from God. I, I want this person to sort of do this unique mission for the church, to be a fool for Christ. It's not something any of us can choose. It's right. like Father Fanuso. Yeah, or Abu Yustus or mm -hmm. Abu Nabi al Abu So these are examples of saints who were called to something that we're not all called to imitate, right? So I would say that, you know, the same thing applies to the example that I gave of Tamav Irini, that, you know, she received uh, perhaps a, a, an inspiration that this request was acceptable for, from God and and she requested it and it was but it's it's not something that all of us again because it could be very presumptuous on our part mm. you know like I said about mm. some of those who thought they could go and be, be martyrs and um, and then ended up renouncing Christ so from the earliest time father um, uh, the martyrdom of Polycarp St. Polycarp is <clears throat> excuse me St. Polycarp is a disciple of St. John the Evangelist the theologian and um, his martyrdom, as written out in the first few paragraphs, 
the, the time is taken to uh, to to digress from his his the story of his martyrdom to comment about the foolishness and the um, the unacceptability, if I could say this, uh, to to go and present yourself before governors to say I'm a Christian, kill me. Yeah. And as Father mentioned, as Father Krulus mentioned earlier, a lot of the people who did this <clears throat> ended up uh, renouncing the faith but because they thought they had they thought they had the courage mm -hmm. to do so, and once they were. But our synexarium has tons of those cases. Sure, and 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 I think the synexarium and Father, please correct me. I think the synexarium mentions this as a specific, um, as a specific calling, as spe mm -hmm. a specific gift, charism as a vocation. Yeah. To, mm -hmm. I I think in the spiritual life, it's very important that we. So, going to some theology a little bit, like spiritual theology the theology of, of the life of holiness and the life of perfection, right? We extract certain universal principles from, from the experience of the saints, beginning in the Old Testament, right? Uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and um, into the New Testament and into the history of the church, right? So we take from the experiences of men and women who lived the life of the Spirit, and we extract certain principles that apply to all of us, right? But there are many things that happen in the lives of the saints that are not meant to be extracted and applied to everybody. For example, very simply, the well, what I call the charismatic gifts. Like, so we take like St. Pope Carlos the VI, mm -hmm. right? There are certain things in his life that we can say, all of us need to learn from this, right? But not all of us need to learn how to do miracles, nor do all of us learn how, need to learn how to cast out demons. Yeah, clairvoyance. Right? Or, yeah. That, right? So there are, certain, there are certain experiences in the saints' lives that were unique or were, were given for the building up of the church, the edification of the church, uh, that aren't meant to be applied by everybody, right? And so even when we read the Synexarium, right, we have to be careful that some of these extraordinary events and, and accounts of some of the things that the saints did again there could there could have been a, a, a real personal inspiration or knowledge that this was god's will for them but it doesn't mean that we look at them and say oh all of us have to do that mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that's where the discernment part is really important in, in suffering in carrying the cross in in being obedient all of these things need discernment right i mean even even the the simple virtues of uh, silence, humility, obedience need discernment, right? Because you could, you could give somebody the silent treatment, and that's not a good silence. Hmm. That's a form of aggression, right? Sure. And so that's not uh, that's not discerning the virtue of silence in the proper way. Somebody could obey somebody in a very dangerous way, and that's not uh, healthy, and that's not using discernment, right? So, so all hmm. of these things need discernment, which is why. We don't do these things alone, right? We have the church. We have our spiritual fathers. We have our communities. We have the writings of the saints and the, the fathers of the church to guide us. Um, I'm really happy you brought up St. Pope Carlos VI because you read Silent Patriarch or you hear the stories or whatever. Be My own father, you know, met him several times, many miracles. There's no Coptic family that doesn't have a story, right? Sure. And you read them and you want to be him. You know what I mean? So it's funny that you say discernment. It's like, that's it. I want to be like him. I want to be him. I just want to hug from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to hug from him. But I, I'm glad you, you brought him up because so you read these stories and you want to emulate, but you're saying discernment. You yes. read the way he lived and you want to emulate. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about myself. If I take off my clothes, put on a black robe and go in the middle of the desert... I'm yeah, coming not, back in that. deep trouble. It's going to be a big problem, especially at night. Once the sun right. goes down, I might be denying my faith out of fear. But so you, you you read of these great saints that touch your heart. And I'm glad you you brought Pope Carolus up. What what do I do with that? What do that what do I do with that warm feeling I get inside reading about his life? And I want to be like him and I want the relationship he had with what's, Christ. What's the most important thing? that should inspire us from the life of St. Pope Carlos or any saint. It's to love God generously. Generously, right. 
That's oh, it, right? Okay. And the way he loved God mm -hmm. is what we read about in his biography, right? Which is related to many, many circumstances and, you know, uh, you know, issues related to, again, God's providence for what he needed for the church at the time, right? Um, but but there's something really important in the silent patriarch. And I, I, I bring this up almost every time I talk about spiritual life. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of the, of the explanation from the late uh, Bishop Athanasius of Beni Swift. Uh, who was one of the many disciples of Father Mina, the solitary, when he was in Old Cairo from the time of 1948 to 1959. And that's a really important time because that's the only time that we uh, have a picture of Father Mina Popkrolos as a spiritual father discipling a group of young men. Right? Like, that, like as Pope, we don't hear about how he took confessions and mm -hmm. how he advised people, uh, and certainly not much also in the windmill. But this period, there was a time of discipleship, right? And so many figures, Pope Shiruda, Bunimetta, mm -hmm. uh, the all -star team. Medius, I mean, so many of them, the right? The spiritual the, the, the great renaissance of our church. Mm -hmm. We could say many of those people all went through uh, the Father Mina in, yeah. in, in, in that time period. And what Amba Athanasius says in one of his uh, his interviews or his uh, reminiscences of, 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 of the saint, is he said that uh, Father Mina at the time, he said he didn't uh, want to create, uh, you know... Um, a one-size-fits-all. A one-size-fits-all, you know, like, this is what I did, this is what you have to do. Hmm. Those who came to him as disciples, he he did what any good spiritual director should do, which is, to help the person discover how is the Holy Spirit leading you to a life of holiness and perfection, right? And so what what um, what Bishop Athanasius said was, he said, if he found somebody that loved to pray the Psalms, he would encourage him to spend more time with the Psalms. If he found somebody who loved to pray the Jesus prayer, he would encourage him to spend more time with the Jesus prayer. In that order. <laughs> if he loved, if somebody loved to meditate on the Scriptures. He would tell them to spend more time with the scriptures. Yeah. If somebody loves service, he would say he would give them money to help them with the service, mm -hmm. right? And so he said he he sought to cultivate freedom in the person to discover the path that the Holy Spirit was That's calling right. that person to, not to be an imitation, a copy of himself. That's a true spiritual director, right? And so when we, when we're inspired by the life of any saint. What, what should inspire us is the love that they had for Christ and the commitment, right? The, like, like the, to commit myself more fully to my discipleship to the Lord, to carry my cross, to follow him, to love him, right? What does it come down to, right? The, the, what, when he, the Lord was asked, what is the greatest of the commandments? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself, yeah. right? And so... Um, it's good to be inspired by the saints. Certainly, uh, I think Father Krulus and I are, mm -hmm. are, would say that St. Pope Krulus is our great patron saint and, and the one that inspires us. And as millions and millions of, of people um, likewise have. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have to realize that I'm not called to be an imitation. Well, what about emulation? Again, in, in what areas that we can extract that are applicable in the spiritual life to everybody? So the, the, the focus on the life of prayer in whatever form that takes, right? The focus on a sacramental life, especially the Eucharist, a focus on... Now, what's one of the essential sort of qualities that you read, especially in the Silent Patriarch and throughout the miracle stories, is this deep compassion, Right. I think for me, uh, what inspires me the most or what, what touches me the most when I read any of the stories of, of this great saint is his, his, his tremendous compassion. He's, there's a cert, certain tenderness, tenderheartedness that he shows in, in his interactions with people, even with his enemies, even with those who are actively persecuting him. He has this very 
merciful, tender-hearted um, way of dealing with people. You know, that's something we can all emulate, right? Yeah. But but to be a patriarch, no. Mm-hmm. To be a cleric, no. To be a wonder worker, no. To be clairvoyant, you know, none of these things are, are necessary for holiness or for salvation. But when you read about how, you know, he would shy away from people who say wonderful things about him, but he would love the people who would, you know, mock him or speak roughly to him. You know, y- you think of these things. Are these not qualities to want to emulate? Yes. Again, I think I think we ask ourselves, are these universal qualities of the spiritual life? That, mm-hmm. that And I think yes. You know. We wrongfully accuse and accept it. Exactly. Like now maybe we're not going to be able to do it to the extent that that we see in his in these stories, but he built up to it too. You know, don't don't right. forget that like this was after you know years and years of, of, of denying himself yeah. and struggling to reach that point where he could love his enemies the way he did and forgive them. Perfect. I love that you said build up because that was my next question. Before you do. Okay, go for yes. it. Yes. Uh, Just uh, remind me build up, okay? Because I'm going to forget. <laughs> build up. Okay, excellent. Go ahead. Yeah. You're going to remember what it is? Uh, no, but go ahead. I'll remember. No, no, no. Just kidding. No, no. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> just, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, Saint Athanasius in his letters to Saint Serapion from the Holy Spirit, he says, he says, you know, the Holy Spirit is is um, the seal, the, you know, the stamp. And the image in that seal is Christ. The image that's in that seal is the image of Christ. Mm-hmm. And he makes holy ones with the image of the holy one when he stamps on us right mm-hmm. now Ab- Ab- abuna Fa- father kirillos <laughs> but he 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 uh he mentions two saints uh saint saint tamav irini mother irini and um baba krolos saint kirillos the sixth who were both in love with other saints that they wanted to emulate to be like mm-hmm. saint irini like Saint Mercurius of the Two Swords and and Baba Krollos's icon is is I mean his is Saint Saint Mina is Saint Mina and side by side now the two names cannot be separated he's Mm -hmm. forever solidified the relationship between those two saints in his own life right and yet one is a fourth century martyr is fourth century right or Mm. or is it third century Saint Mina. I think early regardless, fourth. early fourth, one's a, one's a sol- right? soldier, right? Soldier, right, martyr, Aron- yeah. right? And mm-hmm. the other one is a patriarch in the twentieth century, mm-hmm. and yet no similarities, and and yet both are stamped with the image of Christ. Christ. Mm-hmm. Any icon we have up in the church is the image of Christ yeah. in that saint, f- f- to fully flourished. Mm-hmm. If I could uh, quote also a couple of uh, non-orthodox contemporary, uh, like Father Henry Nouwen. Mm. He says that, um, you know, that every human soul is meant to be sort of a unique saint, right? Like, like each human soul is so unique that, as Father Krulis said, all saints resemble Christ, yet they, they don't, they're not exactly like one another. Yeah, personhood. Right? So that's really, if you think about it, sort of mind-blowing. You can have a billion saints, a billion saints resemble Christ, and none of them are like one another. How is that even possible, Right. But that's that's what is so beautiful about the human soul is that each each human soul is called to be a unique expression of a saint. Um, Therese of Lisieux, a, a, a contemporary uh, a Western saint, she she used the very simple example of like flowers in a garden, you know, and she said it wouldn't be very pleasing to God if every flower in the garden was a rose in the same rose in the same rose, right? <laughs> But he takes pleasure in the fact that there are lilies and daisies and roses and right, and so you know that that's what Father Cole is saying is, is is so beautiful is that I just need to discover the saint that God wants me to be, you know, yeah. and it it may look look nothing like the saint that I love the most in terms of like the outward manifestation, my vocation, right, and it it's not supposed to, you know. And we live in a very different time, different circumstances. Maybe the kind of holiness that God's calling us to, the way that holiness manifests itself is going to be very different than how it did in the fourth century. You know, there's an interesting story that Father Zacharias always tells, probably Father Close, you know this better than me, about uh, an el- uh, yeah, uh, a disciple who goes to his Abba and he says, uh, you know, what do you make of our generation? 
And the Abba says, uh, our generation only has done 50% or half of what the previous generation did. And then the disciple says, well, what will become of the next generation? And he says, the next generation will only do half of the great works of our generation. And he said, and what will happen in the last days? And he said, in the last days, they will not have any of the works that our great fathers of the past generations have had. But those who are able to keep the faith will be greater in the kingdom of God than those who are able to raise the dead by their prayers. Mm. Right? So perhaps holiness today, you know, looks different than it did in the fourth century when the environment was so um, conducive. conducive to holiness that, you know, uh, again, Father Zacharias talks about in the Desert Fathers how they would say like they, they knew fathers who could make the, the sun stop, you know, uh, or they could make it dance in the sky by their prayers, mm -hmm. you know. That's maybe not the environment we live in today, but maybe just... I still have my eclipse keep... glasses. Does that count? For any... <laughs> <laughs> just so that I, I... Way to flatten that point. Yeah, sorry. I, I just killed everything. I forgive me, Father. <laughs> just to loop us back around to suffering along that point of holiness, someone like St. Pope Carlos, his intense depending on prayer and the Eucharist, I don't have that prayer in my life. I, I don't know anyone that does that. That kind of sense of prayer or, or sense of depending on talking with God. Where is the building up? That's what I wanted Ooh. to get to. The steps for the layman, for the for the for the me, to get to that point where I can work myself up to when I am suffering, or in times of tribulation, I have that stick to hold on to which is prayer how did he get it or when i was uh in college my spiritual father who at the time god rest his soul uh, uh father matthias uh, farid wahba uh, was one of those you know fathers from the the generation of pope Quilus who knew him well and saw him many times and and i remember one time i asked him in like our youth meeting i said abuna what was father what was the uh, what was the real sort of secret to this saint like what is the key to the uniqueness of his mm. his deep spiritual life and without even hesitating he 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 did this to me he said i said what do you mean he said he was a beggar mm. he was a beggar right and and i think that for me i've always this has always remained with me as as really the like this idea of poverty of spirit right he was mm. poor in spirit and so I came across this quote. I don't know the origin of it, but it says, you don't need to teach uh, a beggar how to beg. Necessity teaches him. Right? Think about that. You don't need to teach someone who's really about to die of hunger how to ask for alms. Necessity teaches him how to ask. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's going to cry out. He's about to die, right? Pope Kulus was a beggar before God. When when you when you experience your spiritual poverty, you pray. You know you you fall on your on your knees, you fall on your face, and you cry out to God, as we say in Psalm what one twenty nine of the twelfth hour, out of the depths. I've cried out to you, right? How many of us have learned to cry out of the depths? And you won't learn how to cry out of the depths unless you you experience your poverty, unless you're in those times of deep distress or sorrow or suffering. And you know that the only person that can hear you, can respond to you, can console you is, is the Lord. And then you learn how to pray. I think this, this is how he learned how to pray. I, I don't know. This is just my own reflection. But. No, right on. But he had that poverty of spirit, as you say, even as a patriarch. Yes. Right? Never left him. So that, that's what I'm saying. Again, I, I harp on that we're North America, you know, where... You must succeed, you must earn, you must, you know, have nice things and shiny things. And where does one find poverty of spirit in this life that is constantly about the hustle and bustle of daily life? Self-knowledge. Uh, John of the Ladder, in his chapter on discernment, he says the, the, the first stage of discernment, or the first of, of what he, he talks about three forms of discernment. The first one, he says self-knowledge. Then the discerning between good and bad, right and wrong, and then the discerning, or then the supernatural discernment to sort of like see things as God sees them, you know, to know God's will in all things. Um, so we have to we have to enter into that practice of of self knowledge, right? And Isaac the Syrian says that the one who sees himself 
and knows his sin is greater than the one who sees the angels and can raise the dead by his prayers. Right? So we do that obviously through a life of um, vigilance and, and, and guarding of our heart and minds and examining our consciences regularly yeah. of going, you know, repenting and going to confession, you know, praying and prayer. We, we gain that illumination into our, ourselves more deeply. We come to know uh, the true nature of our poverty. And from that, I think springs true prayer, you know, or, or, or true repentance and true prayer. Um, so, so self-knowledge is, is something we're all called, you know, it, it's a great gift. It comes from God. And, and I think God in his mercy gives it to us gradually, because if we, if we were to come to see ourselves as we truly are, uh, we could fall into despair. So it's sort of a gradual process, right? And there's a, one of the desert fathers who was weeping at his, at his bedside and the, his disciples at his bedside. And he said, why are you weeping, father? He said, because of my sins. He said, but you don't have any sins. Father. He said, believe me, my son, if, if, if I was able to see my sins properly, you know, I forget how many he said, would, wouldn't be able enough to weep over them, mm. you know. So how about with Shishoi who says... Uh... Uh, I tell you, brothers, I have not even started to repent. repent. <laughs> so self, self-knowledge self leads to poverty of spirit, right? Because ultimately that's the beginning of the Beatitudes, right? That's the first of the Beatitudes. Mm. We, we, to stand before the Lord with outstretched, that's why we priests, we pray this way. We should take the form of beggars, you know, and all of us should pray that way. Um, and and also it means we're we're expecting, right? It's not just... An expression of, of begging, but it's an expression of, of we, 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 we know we are going to receive. For he is good and lover, lover of mankind. mankind. Right? And so it's an attitude also of expectation. Um, and I forget if it was St. Therese or one of the other Western saints who said that we receive as much as we, we hope for, we expect. Yeah, the Lord says, you know, um, pray as if you had already received, received it. it. Yeah, that's what uh, this is slightly off topic, but on topic at the same time. It's a weird thing. Yeah, but which makes sense in some, our universe. Yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> a conundrum I always had reading about St. Pope Carolus. Hmm. When he had trials or tribulations, he would intensely fast. He more like more fasting, more prayer, be more intense in his spiritual life, even more than it was. But then at the same time, he would strive to look for more trials and tribulations. So is he is he praying and fasting for them to be alleviated or is that just an excuse for him to continually prove his love for god i don't know if maybe father Carlos can i i don't know that i agree with the second part of what you said that he was looking for i think he accepted very and, accepting let's say yeah of, but i don't of, think of, he looked for it I, I don't i don't think he sought to be sort of ridiculed by from within but the church. In some or, Patriarch, it says he, he would really like, you know, cleave to those who would mock him more than he would to those who praise him. Yeah, but him. that's a different thing. That's mm -hmm. a different thing. To So uh, Father Rafael of Amina, he says that uh, many of those who opposed him or who were critical of him, uh, he would keep, keep close to him because it was a way of, of, of keeping him humble. Right. Of sort of reminding him. So like he would and he would say things like when they would ask him, you know, what would you like to eat? You know, and, and he would say expressions in Arabic, but it would be, you know, the translation would be like anything to fill the garbage can. Right. So he always, I think, uh, reminded himself of who he truly was. Right. That spiritually poor person. Right. And so anything based on genuine self knowledge. Yes. Yeah. So anything he could do to maintain that humility, but I don't think he was seeking suffering. I don't think he was seeking, you know, uh, you know, m more um, problems for the church or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's a subtle distinction. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. Okay. I think. I mean, when we speak about Baba Krolos the Sixth, Saint Kirillos the Sixth, we're we're speaking about someone who. Uh, to a very real degree, perfected, like when we say that this man lived the Eucharist, I mean, this man perfected Thanksgiving to such a degree, everything was welcome, and that he handled everything in a cruciform, yeah, in a, in, in a, with his with his already he's 
he's one of those monks that are already hanging on the cross with Christ. Mm. You know, in that in that you know in that revelation that Father Kirillo spoke about. And so, how do you handle anything that comes your way in and through and with the mm -hmm. cross? Um, it's and when you when you say Father the Eucharist, right? I mean, it's it's like important for us also, like when our Lord instituted the Eucharist, right? He said, you know, this is my my body broken, right? Do this in remembrance of me. This is my shed blood do this in remembrance of me and he's not just saying do this ritual but he's saying to his disciples and to us be broken be shed for you know for the sake of the world right and so to you to live a eucharistic life that father's talking about it means also to agree in a sense we could say every time we take communion we agree to be broken and shed Right? And then the early church, they saw that the, the water that was added to the wine is us. right? We are mixed with that chalice of his blood. As if to say, you know, it's not just his offering. We are, we are there being offered with him. You know? And so if, if we are Eucharistic, then that means we agree to be broken, shed, you know, for, the, for the life of the world with him. Right? Apart from him, our, our, our sacrifice means nothing. Mm -hmm. But with him, it has value, right? So that's I think that's the spirituality. This can, this of can't be Pope. stressed enough. What, yeah. the, what you're what you're what you're saying, Father. This can't be stressed enough. And I don't think it's. Um, I mean, it's it's just you can't highlight this enough, yeah. right? That you are saying, "Amen." So be it to me yeah. as well. Yes, you're saying this is the life I want to embrace and grow in and become like. And this is the spirituality of the saint that we're talking about, right? It's not, see, see, sometimes people think that the spirituality is that he prayed so many liturgies. It's not a marathon, right? The spirituality is that he entered into the mystery of, of, of the Eucharist, right? Like, and, and his life re revealed it, right? He revealed it in that, you know, you know, one of the desert fathers said that, you know, what is the definition of humility? And he said, it's to forgive your brother who has wronged you before he asks for forgiveness. Mm. That's the spirituality of Pope. And that's a Eucharistic to spirituality. Forgive. That's the right, You're both right. making me feel very terrible about myself for one very... You're, st you're sitting and it's it's like, it's spiritually romantic almost, you know, <laughs> like entering into the suffering with God. And I love it. And San Ignatius, God, San Ignatius of Antioch. <laughs> See, when he he's, speaks he, about that's it we, we lost him he's he's inflamed he just, with yeah, his love fired for up now he's Not fired up with the love of god but my question is I'm what if you. i don't want what if i don't want to suffer because you're saying it's signing up i'm signing up to suffer with christ right but that's why i'm sure there's yeah. people that are saying i don't want to suffer i, I love christ the disciples I, I said that when they ran away yeah. so exact so but, but so if that happens no, but Peter denied three times there's before a, that, happened, right? A, so, so if the disciples themselves made the decision, the conscious decision, that day, I don't want to suffer with you. There's a lot of people out there who that's no, the honest it's, truth. It, it's a very good, it's a very good point. There's a, a contemporary honest. spiritual uh, writer. His name is Father Jacques Philippe, and uh, <clears throat> he says that often it's the fear of suffering that is worse than the suffering itself, right? So when, when what you describe when somebody says, I don't want to suffer, right? They're afraid of this unknown. They're afraid of entering into this experience. Um, and, and they suffer from that fear, right? There's a, there's, there's, there's a, there's a certain fear, uh, suffering in the fear of suffering, right? And oftentimes what he says is that the suffering itself is, is more manageable than the fear of the suffering. Right. So I but but going back to what I said earlier, it's okay. We don't need to again, we don't need to seek suffering. Mm -hmm. We need to seek the will of God, right? Thy will be done. That's our prayer, right? So so Lord, help me to follow your will, to abide in your will, to do your will today. Whatever today brings. If today brings suffering in the form of a difficult coworker, thy will be done. If suffering today brings a really bad headache, that will be done. If suffering today be, brings uh, difficulty in my service at church, that will be done, right? I, I need to just live the will of God in the moment. And if I do that, mm. if I do that, 
in the little things that happen all throughout the day, and there are lots of them, right? Um, when the bigger things come, right? I lost my job. I have a sick child. You know, I'm going through marital pro, whatever. I will be able to f see the will of God, face, the, you know, um, abandon myself to the will of God, discern the will of God more clearly if I've been doing it already day by day, right? And so I don't have a problem with somebody saying, I don't want to suffer. I, I don't think we need to phrase it that way. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yes, yes. Sorry, okay. I interrupted you, Father. You're you're ablaze in your love for Christ. You're gonna say something about Saint Ignatius if I'm not wrong. Am I wrong? Uh, yes. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Great. No, uh, you lost your train. I, I blocked. Father you, so. Kirillus would Father Kirillus would say this much much better than I would. But you know, Saint Ignatius he has uh, seven epistles attributed to him, and one of them is his famous epistle to the Romans which he's writing to the Romans, um, to, the, to the church in Rome, telling them, I'm on my way. As you know, I've been convicted uh, of whatever accusations there are against me as the Bishop of Antioch. And, and the sentence has been uh, pronounced that I am to be eaten by wild beasts in the Colosseum. And he heard, the reason why he writes the epistles is because that he, he heard rumor, he, news was delivered to him that the Christians in Rome are trying to work out a deal so that he doesn't get eaten. Uh, yeah, mm. basically, he mm -hmm. doesn't have to suffer that sentence. Mm -hmm. And he's telling them, please do not do me the disfavor mm. of preventing this. And he <sighs> says, like Christ, I need to be, and this is hard to say, you know, <laughs> like Christ, I need to be ground mm. as sweet by the teeth of these beasts in order to be made a loaf. I don't want to talk Jesus anymore, my beloved. When, if you let me go through what it is I'm called to go through, I will become a word of God. Mm -hmm. Like everything that I said from the pulpit, every, all the preaching, all the words, all of this is, like, like, like Father Kirillus mentioned before, it's observations as he was commenting about his relative who died in cancer of a young mm. age with ki with children in his toe right it, it, he he um um there's a mystery there that yeah. occurs that when so the word witness has been totally married to suffering in Christ the way we witnessed the way we witness to the glory of god is by seeing someone suffering for Christ, is by suffering for Christ, and and also by seeing someone suffer for Christ. When, when somebody witnesses someone suffering for Christ, they see the glory of God. Yeah. And um, the God's word is pronounced. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's truly said. And people come to believe in Christ by seeing this because mm -hmm. it condemns the vanity of this world. It sets everything. It's the great equalizer of truth you know mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. death as the it's the great equalizer it's but yeah i was gonna say it's it's it, your your reverence is reminding me of the famous uh uh pauline quote um you know where you know saint paul has this thorn in his flesh and he he prays three times to have it removed you know and the lord says to him you know my, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in, in weakness Right? You could replace those words, if you want, with my glory is made perfect in suffering. You know, mm -hmm. like the po my power is shown in what appears to be destruction. Yeah, the inverted right? pyramid. Again. The inverted pyramid again, right? So, so like mm -hmm. Father Cross is saying, like, if we really want to see the, the glory of God, right, then, then it's going to be shown in the pit of human weakness and the pit of human suffering. Right, that's where the glory is going to shine because that's that's the total paradox. That's the total sort of contradiction of worldly glory, and worldly success, and worldly honors. You know, and so Saint Paul says, "I, you know, I I rejoice in my tribulations and my distresses." And you know, he he starts to when he understands that message that Christ gives to him, then he says, "Then I then then I I I I I, I celebrate, I celebrate my weakness." So that the the power of God may be shown in me, right? But again, 
this isn't you know, Father Zacharias. He has a beautiful um, thing about the Christian life. He says the the teachings of Christ, the commandments, are presented to us as hypotheses, and we're invited to make experiments. Right, and to prove the hypothesis. He says all the commandments of Christ are that way. Right? So that, so that w- again, what Father Carlos is saying is you have to live it. You have to experience it. You have to enter into it and then talk about it. And then, then, then see the truth of it. Mm. You know, the example of Ignatius of Antioch. You can't just talk about it theoretically. Right? St. Paul came to understand that from within. You know, and, and, and the saints discovered it from within. And they embraced suffering once they saw, again, that, that, that mystery, that reality from within, right? So it, it's something that, that you know, you, you, you sort of have to, in the words of Father Zacharias, test it. Test it in your life. Genuinely test it. And, and Christ's promises will be uh, fulfilled. If I can, before we conclude, ask you for a favor. I thought because, we were just getting warmed up. Yeah, we are just getting warmed up, Father Thank you. Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me Google. There's something I want to say about What do you want to Google? Just a thing, quote. Mm. Uh, the thing about Christianity. I can't remember it exactly, but the one. I don't quote. know which one you're thinking of, but Here, we can look it up. Phone. Well, before, well. while you're doing, while you're Googling. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. You, yeah. You, you, Father, you brought up Tan Samira in the beginning. And then right now you said you can't just talk about it. You have to witness it. And you were blessed to witness Tansamira, if you can just for those who don't know who she was or myself even take us through how someone who was already devout and spiritual went through otherworldly suffering and came out of it even more spiritual i uh i came to know her um in 2008 when i started serving at saint marina church in irvine and she was already a parishioner there she was already widowed um, her husband had passed away from cancer. Um, I knew her to be a very just pious woman, one of the, these elderly women who was always in church early and praying sincerely. And but we developed, uh, I think, uh, a friendship based on on our mutual love for Saint Pope Carlos the Sixth. Uh, she knew him when she lived in Egypt and had a very close relationship with him in the flesh. And of course, I just uh, knew him from from books and from. Uh, from reading about him and, and admiring him as, you know, as a youth and so on. Um, and with time, she began to open up to me about events in her life. And, uh, and I would say that she, um, she was very much formed by her uh, contact with a saint. I think any one of us who comes into contact with a saint, you know, is sort of, uh, there's something engraved on, on us from that experience. And certainly that was the case for her. She, she had a few years during the mid sixties where she was very close to St. Paul. She would visit him regularly. They would have breakfast together. Many, many miracles that happened during that time with her. And, um, he would often speak to her about prayer, praying the Psalms, about uh, fasting, about prostrations, about the liturgy, so she she very much had that spirituality. She was very much what I called an ecclesiastical, you know, saintly person. Her whole spiritual life was based on the Eucharist, the Egbeya, the Bible, fasting. I mean, that's, you know, you could pretty much reduce her spiritual life to that. But she took all of those things, you know, very seriously. And, and uh, but she lived a very normal life. I think when, when I talk about Tansamira and we talk about some of the extraordinary stories that I witnessed with her, but... Her life was very ordinary. You know, she, she married a non-Egyptian man. She had two uh, children. She um, had lots of um, different um, jobs. They moved from place to place. They had financial difficulties. They had marital strife. They had, uh, you know, moments of, you know, happiness and they had moments of strife. They, they, there was, there's nothing unusual about her life, you know, but she maintained sort of... Uh, that, that foundation that she received from her encounter with the saint. And she lived it in her own way. Uh, at times, she couldn't live it as, as perfectly as she wanted to. Uh, at times, her, her husband wasn't as conducive to like regular church going and, and, and things like that. Um, and once she was widowed, I think she, she just dedicated herself more fully to that life. You know, and she, I would say, 
in many ways, she lived a monastic life, at least after hours. You know, a lot of times she would stay from, you know, um, late at night until early in the morning, praying and reading and, and doing prostrations and, and uh, uh, you know, meditating and so on. Um, so uh, she, she, there's really nothing extraordinary about her, is my point. You know, mm -hmm. is that, you know, the, the only thing that's extraordinary is that she was fortunate enough to be close to a saint for a period of her life, you know, and sh that became a foundation for her, you know, and yes, she, she endured uh, many, many trials in her life, even when she was in Egypt and uh, through her marriage and, you know, again, with financial uh, problems here and there. And, um, and then later her health de deteriorated. She had uh, uh, heart failure, congestive heart failure. She had, uh, uh, really bad skin psoriasis. Mm -hmm. Her lungs were totally gone. She was, you know, on oxygen all the time. Um, and then ultimately she had a form of, of blood cancer. Um, so, but again, I think the, the, the building up of her spiritual life prepared her to, to meet the challenges of every day. You know, and that was the key is that it didn't just come out of a vacuum. You know, uh, she wouldn't have been able to endure in the loving and pure way that we saw her uh, in those last two years of her life with all of her suffering that sort of, you know, reached a climax. Um, had she not been living the Christian life as best as she could, you know, every day, you know, since she left Egypt in her early 20s. Um so, so I think, again, you have to sort of put into balance the, um, the extraordinary, you know, things that we, we read about the saints and the stories with sort of the, the daily grind that they, that they lived before that in order to, to reach some of these levels of, of prayer. I don't know, like, specifically if I answered your question or... No, I was just curious because i know that she went through a lot of suffering but she was also a very blessed woman and a lot of people came to know her as being very yeah and and some of the extraordinary things that we witnessed with her were really in the last 18 months two years of her life you know and and but people think that she sort of had all of this throughout her life and she didn't you know um so such as like what, what for those who don't know so um in the last 18 months or two years of her life, she started to have regular visits from like St. Pope Rulus and other saints in her room, uh, in the church. Oftentimes uh, it was accompanied by, you know, the beautiful fragrance that accompanied the, the visit of visits of the saints. Mm. Many times we would see oil on her head from where uh, St. Pope Rulus either put his hand or the cross on, on her head. Um, she was she was um, often taken in the spirit, you know, uh, like the sowa, uh, mm -hmm. to places. Uh, uh, many times when she was too sick to go to church, she would come in the spirit, and she would, you know, and and all of these things. I I I I don't speak about them unless I verified them, and I have my my own ways of verifying them. Either I was present, I was a witness. I had ways of like obviously verifying these things. You know, uh, sometimes she would come in the spirit to so, to somewhere where I was, and she could only only she could uh, know mm -hmm. something that she saw. You know, um, other times she could really sense and feel what people were going through. Like many times, if I was like sitting in my family room with my you know head of my you know like you know, my hand sort of like overthinking something, she would call me and she'd be like, "Stop thinking." pray more, mm -hmm. you know, she'd like catch me in, in my, you know, the, the whirlwind of my thoughts. And she did that with people like if somebody was at home crying, she would often call them and like console them and she could see. And she would tell me that sometimes how these things happened with her, you know, that um, she would be praying and she would just see an image of somebody, let's say, who was crying. And so she knew that somebody was in, was distraught or something or, um, or at times when she was too sick to go to the church. And she really wanted, to, she, she hated missing. Like the, the, the most important thing for her was liturgy. So if she was too sick to make it to the church, she was really, really uh, upset by that. So sometimes one of the saints, usually St. Saint Paul, but sometimes it was the Maverini or other saints would come and 
and say, let's go. And she would, they would grab her by the hand and she'd find herself in the church. And she would tell me very specifically where she was sort of sitting or standing and she could hear conversations. She could see things in the altar. Or she could tell me things that I knew it was impossible for her to know. Um, she sometimes had uh, prophecies that were given to her for like people who were trying to have children and, and things like that. There wasn't that. There wasn't a lot of that. Um, uh, there were times, obviously, when she was praying, where again we 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 knew that she was visited by a saint, especially if she was in tremendous pain, um, and we would. You know, we'd be around her and, and immediately we would smell the fragrance and we would see the oil and oftentimes we would, you know, we would wipe it and keep it as, uh, as a blessing for ourselves. But again, uh, she was even surprised by a lot of these experiences because it wasn't typical for her throughout her whole life. It was all very much at the end of her life. Mm -hmm. You know, she saw multiple saints in the liturgy. You know, she saw unique saints that she didn't know who they were. You know, she saw like Saman al Kharas. She saw um, Abuna Ibrahim al Basit. She saw. How would some, she confirm them after? You always pop girls. Um, she would describe somebody to me, and I would be like, "I'm not sure." And then I'd say, "Wait until you see the saint again and ask him." And then he would tell her that was so and so. Um, saint Moses the Black, uh, Abu Sufyan, like uh, Saint Marina, Saint Marina, many, many, many saints. She saw, mm. she saw the angel of the sacrifice at every liturgy. At some point, she started to see it, and she saw it every liturgy. She saw angels on two sides of the altar. This is a thing now. Next to, uh, this is a thing now. What is a thing? <laughs> like it gets added and doesn't go away. Uh, the angel yeah, of the yeah exactly. It was. Uh, <laughs> And one, it was interesting, you know, there's some humor. One time she asked St. Pope Kula, she said, you know, why am I seeing mm. all of this? This is a hard one. You know, why am I seeing all of this now? And um, no, there, I think you're also thinking of another, but there's two uh, questions she asked. One was, why am I seeing all of this now? And he said, God opened your eyes only a little bit. <laughs> only a little bit. Like, the don't think all of what you're seeing is is much, you know. Uh -huh. But another time she asked him, why are you coming to me? Uh, because, you know, she had been a disciple of him since she left Egypt in the late 60s. And she saw him once, as a, in, uh, she saw him maybe in dreams, but she only saw him, I think, once where he appeared, like in her family room. And all of those years until the very end of her life, when then he was appearing almost daily at times. <laughs> and he said... Again, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but he said to her, you suffered a lot in your life and God allowed me to be close to you in this time. You know? so, so when so, St. Paul speaks of consolations, yeah. it's, uh, Abba, can you uh, tell us a story about, my favorite story of mm. her, of all, Which one is uh, that? about her commitment to the divine liturgy where once the saint was with her in her room at home and she said, okay, but Ah, uh, when she missed the bus. Uh, so this was actually one of the f the first times that he, again, sort of in this two-year period where he started to appear to her, uh, not just in a sort of vision, but like as a as a person, she could touch him. You know, mm. she was uh, in those days. She didn't uh, she didn't drive since I knew her. She never drove, so she either took uh, public transportation, or sometimes I would pick her up if it was a weekday liturgy. Um, in this case, she had uh, sort of an ongoing schedule with the uh, Orange County Transit Association, whatever they, it's called, OCTA. And they always knew, like on Wednesdays, Fridays, what time to pick her up to take her to the church, and what time to pick her up from the church and bring her home. So she would always be dressed with her purse outside of her apartment, waiting for the the, the bus or the, the, the minibus or the van to come. And she waited and waited and waited and... They didn't come until 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So she got very frustrated. She went back into the house. She called them and they told her, yes, uh, Miss Samira, um, you changed the time for pickup. She said, of course, I didn't change. The time. It's the same. You've been doing this for years. I would never change the time. They said, well, we're really sorry. Like the time was changed in the system. We can send somebody, but it'll take like, she said, no, it's too late. By the time I get to church, she, she did not like to go to church late. She wanted to be in church before the priest. She insisted to be at church sometimes before the priest. So she came back into the house, very frustrated, very upset. She could get angry. She could get angry. And uh, she went into her room to change out of her church clothes, put her purse in her room. She came into her room. She found St. Pope Corlo sitting on the edge of her bed with his cross, smiling at her. 
So, of course, she was very happy to see him. And after sort of that initial shock, she starts complaining to him about how... Uh, she's missing liturgy. I'm missing liturgy. <laughs> Saint, Saint Why did you allow for me she, to miss liturgy? You know, she's complaining this is the about mark the bus of the saint. system. This, yeah. this oh, lover of sobriety is really important. She would choose like, liturgy over the visitation of thousands of saints and angels. That's incredible. And then there's, and I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating. This is thing. the way. I'm not exaggerating. This is the. <laughs> so she started to complain to him, like, "Why did you allow me to miss the the liturgy? Why didn't you intervene?" You know, and he's just smiling. He's not saying anything. And then a few moments later, she hears in her apartment complex there were uh the people who did like the maintenance work they drove around on like these little golf carts so she hears one of these little golf carts kind of comes like screeching in front. her her apartment uh her bedroom was right facing the outside like entryway of her apartment and the window was open so she hears the the gentleman uh you know frantically calling out her name samira samira so she if is sitting there you know, so she goes to the window and she's, you know, what, what, what's happening? He says, thank God, thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. She's like, what happened? What happened? He says, the bus that you always take uh, got into a, a major um, a clash, uh, you know, a collision in the intersection. And the ambulance and the fire trucks are all in their way. And I thought you were in there. And thank God you, you're you not there. And and then she looked at him and he's just smiling at her. And, um so that was maybe the beginning of when he started to appear very regularly to her. Mm. Um, but there was another time. Uh, I mean, we can go on. This is gonna. This is gonna. That's lovely. But I'll just give you another example of how she sometimes was taken in the spirit. We were appendix. We were visiting. Uh, I like the story. It's just kind of charming. Mm. There, there are others, but this one's just sort of charming. Uh, we were every Lent our parish. We would either go to. Uh, our Coptic monastery or we'd visit like another like a non-orthodox monastery and have like a re- like a one-day retreat there and so we were visiting this Carmelite monastery in a city called Alhambra we'd never been there before it's a convent and it's about like an hour away from from our parish and uh, Tan Samira was anything that had to do with monasticism she was always very excited about you know she loved she wanted to be a nun before she left Egypt but Pope Carlos told her it wasn't her vocation and um, so, so she was planning to come and she was going to go with me in the car and she was very excited. The night before, because of her health, her daughter like refused for her to, to go. It was going to be a long drive, a long day, you know, long drive back. And she was very upset. So we were at the convent and one of the nuns is giving us a tour of the convent and we're visiting the main church of the convent and it's this beautiful, uh, you know, um, church that sort of has this this theme of angels, the stained glass, all angels. It's just everywhere you look, there's like this theme of angels. And we we visited the church. We started to walk out, and she calls me on my phone, and she says, uh, "Father, the the church is so beautiful. Angels are everywhere." And I said, "Samir, did you come? Were you here?" And she says, "I'll, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later." And then she said, but it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And she was really happy, right? So, and then she said, um, the, uh, and outside of the door of the main church, there's the, there's the basin that has water in it. She starts describing things to me that I didn't see, right? So I said, okay, I'll, when I finish, I'll call you. So then I, I turned to my wife and I said, she mentioned something about some basin at the front. I don't know why she mentioned it. Um, do you remember seeing that? My wife said, no, I don't remember. I said, let's go back. You know, this is so I would test these things sometimes. She would tell me that she saw something that I didn't see. So I went back and sure enough, right when you enter into the main doors of the church, there's this big basin and it's filled with water. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. She saw that. I didn't see that. And why did she even mention it? You know, so later when I, I got home, I called her. So I said, tell me what happened. Hmm. So she said, I was in my room. I was praying. And I was very upset that I couldn't be with you that day. And she said, Baba came. She always called him just Baba. She said, Baba came. And she started complaining to him again. Baba, you know that I wanted to go. And that, and he's just, you know, kind of going off on mm-hmm. him. And so he just grabbed her by the hand and said, okay, yalla bina. Yalla, let's go. Let's go. She said, yalla Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she said, I found myself where all of you were. And he himself is giving me sort of a tour. And he's, you know, and so she's seeing the church of course, in her own way. 
And uh, and I said, why did you mention the, the 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 basin? You know the. And she said, oh, because when he was showing me the church, I asked him what this was for. Like, why would they have a, a thing of full of water right before you walk in? So she said, he explained to me that in their tradition, before they enter the church, they dip their hand in the water and they make the sign of the cross. It's a, like a, a reminder of their baptismal waters when you enter the church. It's a beautiful little tradition. Mm. So you know, so she got a better tour than, <laughs> than some did. of us, I think. Um, so this is one of the many Would like, she have, moments. Uh, uh, things like that with other parishioners? Like uh, just she'd have moments or miracles did other people have these things with her and like did other people experience yeah sure i i wasn't the only one i mean she opened up to me sort of as i don't want to say i was her spiritual father i I always consider her my spiritual mother Mm -hmm. but i think there was a spiritual friendship and i think Mm -hmm. i was for her the confirmation from the church that she was looking for because you know she herself was at, at times overwhelmed confused by the amount of these spiritual things that were happening to her she needed the the church to be present with her to accompany her so for for her that was me you know so she opened up to me about things that a lot of people didn't know about but other people like sometimes when during wednesday liturgy she couldn't contain herself like during uh, especially i don't i don't know why father but especially um as soon as we began the anaphora part where we say the three agios agios for some reason, that was always when she saw the saints descend, you know. So uh, a couple of times we'd be in Wednesday liturgy. And uh, as soon as we start the agios, sometimes she'd exclaim out loud, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and then I look by, behind me when she's covering her mouth because she realized that she just blurted out, you know. Sometimes we would smell something beautiful. People around her would smell and they knew that she was seeing something, you know. So, of course, I am praying so I can't find out until I'm done. And then I would ask her, like, what happened? She would say, oh, like, she would always see Pokulus, like, on on my right side or on the right side of the priest. And uh, oftentimes when he came, that's where he was standing. But any other saint that was came, she would see sort of descend on the left side of the altar, you know. And for her, sometimes that was some somebody that she didn't know or somebody knew. So, um but but many people witnessed either uh, again like the fragrance or the the oil, um, or when she gave them a message that uh, again she didn't have you know it wasn't her thing prophecy or anything but but at times if somebody was really struggling with something and asking her to pray if she received the response from heaven she would give it. Um, didn't she once? <laughs> please, I, I might have been, imagined this, but didn't she once interrupt the saint? while he was appearing to her in the flesh uh, in order to make her way to liturgy? Okay, I got to go. Or am I remembering that wrong? I don't remember. Maybe... Uh, the story uh, really marked me when I heard it from you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me. Yeah. These are special people. But I, I want to say something because um, but, but, I, I know that these... We do the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> I know that this, this part of the conversation... Uh, you know, nobody has to believe any of this stuff. It's okay. Like if 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 some people struggle with this part of the the supernatural like experience of some people, it's not necessary to believe in it. You know, um, and I I say that because I don't I don't I don't want it to be a struggle for somebody. You know mm-hmm. that 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 we we don't need these things. She 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 herself you know, um, while it was a consolation for her in many ways, but she always knew that the real spiritual food was the Eucharist, was the Word of God. She would tell me that that oftentimes she, throughout the, the middle of the night, she would just read the scriptures. She'd say, I don't understand a lot of what I'm reading. She was a very simple person. Mm. She didn't have like a library of commentaries and church mm. fathers. So she would she would say, you know, sometimes when I read, you know, for hours the Bible, and I don't understand a lot of what I'm reading, but I just keep reading. She said sometimes Pope Quillis would come and explain something to me, but but oftentimes n- no, you know. So she 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 again her, her 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 real spiritual food was not that she was waiting for visitations of angels and saints, mm-hmm. was the liturgy, was uh, her love for fasting. I mean, she had a real love for fasting, and she said she learned that from from him. She the way she said it was that I learned to sort of disdain the desire for food from Pope Carlos, you know, that that was something very early in her life. She sort of learned from him was 
to not give in to sort of the, the, the you know, an over, an over desire for the yeah, of the palate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she, she could eat very simply. She could fast, you know, and when she wasn't really sick, she would fast all of Holy Week without eating, you know, when, in one of her last uh, years, uh, maybe the year before she passed even, she, uh, or two years before she passed, she was in church on Good Friday. She was the first person in church um, before the rest of the deacons and before we started. She stood for every part of Good Friday that, you know, wasn't where everybody has to sit like the sermon, you know, mm. but for all the long hymns and where a lot of people sit, she was standing. She had oxygen. She had an oxygen tank next to her. Mercy, mercy. And when we all left, we finished at like 5, 6 p.m. Good Friday, right? We all rush out, eat our tame, our full sandwich, we miss- try to sleep a couple hours and come back to church, mm-hmm. right? She never left the church. She stayed in the pew. She well, didn't well, eat yes. until we came back at 11 p.m. She was still st- sitting in the pew praying, not sleeping, praying. And then stayed with us all night, took communion in the morning, and then went home. That was her spirituality. All the other stuff, you don't have to believe it. You don't need to believe it. You don't need it. You know what I mean? Like, I, she would tell you that, you know. I, 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 I say I believe it, and I witnessed it, and I see it as a very beautiful part of our spirituality. But I know that there are some in our church, even among the, the clergy, who don't want to get into these things and you know and don't want people to run after these things and i and i don't i don't blame them i understand mm-hmm. that some people might be consumed by some of this yeah. i don't know what, like part of that like is his, prudence yeah, yeah. Sure, why not? Like, I, mean, I, I just say that as a as if a even as her a, she's upset and complaining to a, a saint that she missed liturgy that's probably the greatest example of, of i i stand lesson. by that that she would she would choose one divine liturgy over any visitation of any saint or or blessing in that way. That's a great lesson for yeah. a lot of us. Uh, I feel like we do the opposite sometimes. Maybe and and she, you know, she was very kind, very um, gentle. But when it came to the reverence of the church, she was a lion. Especially the reverence for the moment of Holy Communion. She would tell me that nothing disturbs her more or or sh- or brings out her zeal or her her uh, her zeal more than people in line for communion who are not aware of the magnitude of what they're about to partake of who are who are you know sort of taking it as routine or chatting in line or you know this for for her was the greatest tragedy of of uh of sort of our participation in liturgy so the eucharist for her was the, 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 everything was the pinnacle. Everything else was a preparation, was feeding into that, you know, the fasting, the agbeya. The scriptures. The scriptures, everything was. May the, God open all our eyes by their prayers, honestly. That's, uh, that's incredible. Well, thank you both very much. That was lovely. I hope that we got a message of... Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I want to say. <laughs> I hope we got God's glory through suffering and in suffering and God's love through it all. That's what I took out of it. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.